Hi, this is Damien Brady from SSW, and I'm joined today by Anthony Vanderhorn, who's one of the authors of Glimpse. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on board. No worries. So, uh, let's start at the start. How about you give us a little bit of information about what Glimpse is and why we would want to use it? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, essentially, diagnostics is hard, and it's something that we do every single day. And, you know, when looking at this stuff, what is I'm working uh, on trying to diagnose different issues or debugging things or whatever else. And the web isn't simple. You know, there's it's a complex ecosystem of different frameworks and environments that we use. Um, and the question came up is, what if we could make this simpler? You know, what if we could reduce this complexity down into something that really gave us a quality overview of uh, what's going on with uh, with a request and within your application? So um, one day with uh, my friend Nick Molnar, Molna, who I work on Glimpse with, we were sitting down and we were discussing, you know, how could we make this simple, this process simpler? Um, the ecosystem is only becoming more complex, as I mentioned and with frameworks coming out that are like convention over configuration where if you don't know the conventions about something, i.e. if you don't name an MVC, if you don't name your controller with a, p a postfix of controller, uh, it won't work and it just won't tell you why it doesn't work, then, you know, that's a problem. And so we thought, well, what happens if we could get in there and we could get into the pipeline if you were web application information as a request is going on and what happens if we could gather that bundle it all up and show you that in a you know Chrome DevTools sort of experience down the bottom of your page and so that way for any request that you make you can just click on the icon open it up and you'll be able to see you know what decisions did that framework make to you know present the page that you're seeing or you know what was the state of the server at the time or what server did you hit and what was its environmental factors that were there um, and so this was really what we were wanting some of the problems that we we're wanting to solve and some of the considerations that we we're thinking about when we we're uh, you know starting to develop the concept for glimpse Okay, so ultimately what, what you're really doing is you're taking diagnostic information from the server and presenting it on the <laughs> client side. Yeah. yeah. Um, more than that, though, is I think that was the original intent and back in the day, you know, when we were first working on Glimpse, uh, we kind of said, you know, um, Glimpse is Firebug for the server. So if you imagine Firebug, Chrome DevTools, you know, they're showing you everything for the client in the bottom of your page. Here's Glimpse. It'll show everything along and uh, with the way that Glimpse has been architected, it's got no real dependency on the server backend. It just expects a data payload. And so when we started going along, we started realizing that Glimpse was a lot more than just, you know, X dev tools for your server. It could really act as a bridge between your client and the server. Now, what I mean by that is imagine if you could capture an image, you know, a diagnostics picture of everything that happens from the start of a request all the way through the lifetime of that request when it finishes on the server, then coming back onto the client to DOM ready. And what happens if you could then pick that up into the lifetime of that page, okay, i.e., um, you know, picking up what uh, some JavaScript frameworks might be doing on your page or something like that. And so we started realizing that, hey, we've actually got a diagnostics platform on our hands, which we've, we do ship uh, some plugins by default with, but this is a platform that allows us to serve up diagnostics information and it doesn't matter where that comes from. And since we've had that realized and started having plugins for the server, but we're starting to come up with plugins for the uh, client as well. The other realization okay. that we had on top of that, that was that it's not just about, you know, server or client, um, because there's a lot of tools out there that gives you like an insight as to how much CPU usage your server might be having or how much memory it might be having, but none of those have the context of how your system's supposed to be operating. And so what Glimpse can do is it can get in there and it has intimate knowledge around what frameworks you're using and how they're supposed to be operating. So by the virtue of that, we know how MVC is supposed to work or we know how Entity Framework is supposed to work, we can give you much more relevant content 
context, you know, as to what's going on here. And that's likewise, and one of the best analogies I've got for that is imagine you're on the client, you can think, well, what happens if I want to debug knockout? Okay, well, people's usual answer is, well, I've got a console and, you know, I can debug it that way. But if you're not familiar with knockout, what do you do? You, <laughs> what would you type? Start typing in knockout and hope it auto completes in in the uh, you know in the console. Not you know how it's supposed to be operating. You know you don't know where to go to get into that global state if it does have global state to kind of figure that out. And so what a yes. what a plugin could do on on the Glimpse platform is it can actually go in, have knowledge of the context of how knockout is supposed to be operating, and that pr present that back to you. And that's really where the power of Glimpse starts to come come into its fru uh, full fruition. Okay, awesome. Well, why don't we um, have a look at uh, Glimpse in action? You've sent me a mm -hmm. kind of a clean um, project which doesn't have Glimpse mm -hmm. installed on it, so that's just here. So this mm -hmm. is the um, NBC Music Store, which uh, watches mm -hmm. of SSW TV, and people who have come to our NBC course would be pretty familiar with it. It's, um, one of the great samples that Microsoft's put out. So um, we've got that project and it works. It doesn't have Glimpse installed. Um, can you walk me mm -hmm. through um, installing it and, and, and then we can have a look at how it works? Yeah, so when we built Glimpse, um, Nougat was, had just been released by Microsoft and so we hopped on the Nougat bandwagon, um, which for those who are familiar new able to install um, DLLs into your project um, without having to manually add things or put them in the right place so if we uh, you know go to the package management um, window uh, if we right click on the project uh, we should see um, if all is with us uh, manage yep yeah, NuGet packages and here we'll be able to see a list of uh, all the various packages that uh, we have installed but by default it's going to show us which ones are available online here so what we can do is we can actually do a search here for glimpse and because this is an MVC application, we're actually going to be installing the MVC3 application because that's what this is, a uh, package rather. Okay. Now, at any time, you could just install call, you could just install ASP.NET. Because of the way NuGet works, it allows us to be very modular with how we put things together. And so if you don't have an MVC project, you obviously don't want to install MVC. So you might just install ASP.NET, which is basically web form support. Um, but right. if you do want to install MVC, MVC has a dependency on ASP on core. And if we click install, you should be able to see that it'll go off and resolve those dependencies and download those other packages, uh, which we can see it's running through right now. Um, so it's getting off, going off to the server. It's getting the latest versions of uh, Glimpse, and uh, we've just installed those. Uh, before we cut out of this window, we're also going to mm -hmm. install uh, Glimpse EF. Um, so if we scroll down, we might see it in the bottom of the window here. Uh, we'll uh, have to get one more over before doing a closer search. Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. Okay, uh, go to just type in. Yeah, we want 4.3. So type in EF 4.3 after that. Uh, it should just be EF 4.3, I think. Uh, maybe I might have to leave out. Oh, there we go. Cool. So we'll Found install it. that, and that'll install its dependencies as well. Okay, great. So we're just installing those. That's got a dependency on glimpse.ado. And so now if that's gone off, it's installed. And what you'll be presented with here is once we close this window is um, you'll actually see the release notes that uh, we've put out for Glimpse. So we're able to detect you know which packages you've just installed and if you scroll down you'll see all the various packages you've installed and we'll give you the release notes and you're able to see hey look the installed version 1.31 1 or whatever it happens to be and that is the version that you actually have and you'll be able to see what we actually did um, in that release. Uh, we also when so we go through an update uh, experience with Glimpse give you a similar screen. Okay, so the Glimpse you know, EF43 and .ABO, are these essentially plugins for Glimpse? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so the way that Glimpse works is um, 
typically we have uh, packages that are that's the metaphor that uh, NuGet works in, uh, and a package can have multiple plugins essentially. So, um, for instance, uh, Glimpse Core has got a few plugins out of the box. Uh, ASP.NET has got a couple more. MVC's got a bunch that are relevant to MVC uh, and ADO and EF. Have got the ones that are relevant to the you know, SQL requests. So it's not a one-to-one, -one. one package equals one tab. Uh, sometimes it might be. So if you downloaded the um, Glimpse Elma package, um, it would be one tab that would pop up. But if you installed Glimpse MVC3, that would be you know a few different tabs. And so it really depends on what the package author has decided to do. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, so from can I hit here, F5 now, um, is that? Yeah, you should be able to click F5. Uh, or play, whichever one we'd like to do. Yeah. Um, and the demo gods being with us, um, your application should just start as normal. And what Glimpse has actually done is it's, um, it, it, as part of the install project for, uh, process for NuGet, it's um, installed a couple, uh, it's put in a couple of, uh, one HTTP module and a HTTP handler. And so those are the things that Glimpse requires to be able to hook into the pipeline and to be able to start extracting the information that we need to get out of Glimpse. Um, so, once the page loads, and is that coming up for you? All right, let me just <laughs> let me just do this. Uh, it's not. I have an issue with um, with Chrome on this machine occasionally. Just, can you give that another go? Okay, not to worry. So whilst we're doing that, um, so we've got the HTTP handler and we've got the HTTP module. Now the module is what we use to be able to get that information through the pipeline, and the HTTP handler uh, is what we use to start serving up uh, the various um, uh, assets that Glimpse has. Now in this example, it looks like Glimpse is already turned on. You'll be able to see it down in the bottom right-hand corner. But usually, we don't. Glimpse isn't turned on out of the box. So the way Glimpse works is that you decide which requests that you would like Glimpse to be turned on for. We don't dictate, hey, Glimpse is on for every request, okay? Because there is a small, you know, very small performance overhead to capturing some of the data that we're capturing. So you might decide, hey, now I don't want it, or yes, I do want it all the time. So to be able to actually turn Glimpse on, what we know Normally, we'd go at the top there, so we'd go slash glimpse.axd. And this is like the configuration page um, that uh, Glimpse provides out of the box. Uh, and from this, we'll be able to see a couple of big buttons that allow us to turn Glimpse on. If we click the off button, we'll see what it would normally look like for someone when they come along. Um, so as you can see, Glimpse is now turned off. Okay. Um, so if we scroll down here, though, we can see that Glimpse is trying to tell us these are the registered tabs that we have installed. And so from here, you can see what I was meaning about it's not a, necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between a package okay, and the tabs that are installed for a given package. Okay, so we can see all the different tabs that we have installed then at the moment. Um, so if we okay. scroll back up, what we want to do is we want to turn Glimpse on, um, which we can do just by clicking this button every time if we want, or that button is just a link, and we can actually drag that link up into our bookmarklets. And so in the future, we can just use bookmarklets to turn Glimpse on and off. And what that's actually doing in practice is just setting a cookie that it looks for at the beginning of a request. If that cookie's present, it'll say, cool, I need to do my stuff. Otherwise, it's going to say, I'm going to get out of this entirely. Okay, I don't want to touch anything. So now, if we go back to your home page um, of this site, um, you'll be able to see that Glimpse has popped up at the bottom right-hand corner. Okay, And with the way that Glimpse works, you can just click on that, and Glimpse will open up. Okay, and we can actually see what Glimpse looks like. And for those who might be familiar, it does look a bit, you know, DevTools-ish, okay, and that's what the kind of look we were originally going for in Glimpse. Uh, by the time you're looking at this, you'll probably, there'll probably be some UI updates around this, um, but this is what we have at the moment, and the basic information is going to be the same. Um, but you've got these tabs, you can switch between tabs to kind of see everything that's going on here. 
Um, and so yeah, this is this is kind of glimpse in a nutshell. So as you can see, all you've got all sorts of different tabs that uh, are useful in different scenarios. Some are MVC specific, others are not. Great. Can we? Uh, do you mind having a quick look at some of these ones um, in particular? So we're using an MVC application, um, and this mm -hmm. is one of the things I I mainly use um, glimpse for is this routes. Um, Sometimes if you've defined your own funky looking routes in MVC, it can be a bit confusing where this page came from. You can go to a URL and it's not quite giving you the page that you want. Um, so that's where I find this tab yep. really useful. So, so this tab, uh, I understand, gives you all of the routes that are available and then highlights what's being used at the time. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in this scenario, in this example application, the routes aren't very interesting, uh, as you yeah. kind of highlighted. But most applications will have in the order of 20 to 50 different route configurations, usually. At least that's what I found. Um, mm -hmm. And so it can actually become a lot more complex to try and understand why did a particular route match. Okay, and so this is where that convention over configuration stuff that we were talking about earlier really comes into its zone. And how did this actually get matched is, is a real pain in the butt. Um, yeah, so here, here we can see that um, it's matched on the second route that we've got registered, and the URL that it had uh, is controller action ID. And so what we've done in the data column there is broken those out and actually said, well, these are the, the defaults, the values in brackets are the defaults that would be used if nothing is provided, mm -hmm. and then we can see what the system actually used. So if we leave this, if we leave Glimpse up and navigate to another page like Rock, for instance, oh. or any of the other ones, mm -hmm. um, you'll see that we're actually, those values will change. So we can see that it's store and browse. Okay, so that's saying that even though the default is home and the default is index, the what it the system actually used was store and browse. Okay, and we can even see how long it took to actually process that route, uh, which in this case is is virtually negligible. Negligible, but in other cases where you might have complex uh, constraints uh, that are fairly involved, regular uh, type of constraints, uh, it could be a, uh, there could be an overhead for what you're doing. And so we're trying to bubble that up to the surface to let you know, hey, this is what you're doing in here. And you know, it is something that you should be paying attention to. Um, another, oh, inter really cool. another interesting another interesting one that people find useful sometimes is the execution tab. So if we switch over to it. Yep. Um, you'll be able to see that uh, we're presented with a list of the execution pipeline. Okay, so we can see that the first thing that happens in the system is that um, we hit the store controller. Okay, and we hit the browse action, and the authentication filter is hit. Okay, and so we can see that yep, it got past that. We're all good, okay? Then you can see we came on to the next one, which is again still in the store um, controller. We hit the browse action, okay? And this is the an action filter, okay? Um, that is the executing side of that filter, okay? And every every controller has this built in by default to like the base classes like that. This particular project doesn't have anything too interesting here in terms of filters, but if you had more complex filters set up, you'd actually see whereabouts in the pipeline they're actually executing, whether it's beforehand or afterwards. If you overrode the default uh, base, you know, um, executing uh, filter on the controller and then had your own decorated uh, filter on top, you'd be able to see, well, how is MVC interpreting that order? Um, particularly when you start getting to the realm of global filters as well. Where does that order hierarchy actually operate? And so the ones that are highlighted here are the actual actions. And so you can see that the primary controller is store, browse, and then we went off down to um, the shopping cart and to the cart summary, which if under the is child column, we can see, hey, this is actually a child action uh, that we actually got called uh, at some point in the processing pipeline. Okay. And we can see that with, with most of these cases, the things that take the most time are the actual actions, which is it's kind of what we have. Most of the filters uh, that are here by default have virtually no overhead uh, because of the implementations that they have. 
Um, we can kind of see this 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 gra this little map reflected if we switch over to the timeline tab, where we can actually start to see um, all the different request uh, all the different like um, a waterfall breakdown of the requests and as stuff happened. So if we make this a little bigger, um, you'll actually be able to see here's the start of the request, the authorization filter that we saw on the previous screen, the executing filter. Then we see the action, but now. Where because this is a you know an overall timeline, we can actually see ah the reason that one actually took a long time that action was we spent most of the time opening up the connection and closing the connection. Okay, but it's also I think interesting to actually see the command itself only was a very very short command. It took two milliseconds, but the connection was actually open for a much longer period of time. Okay, so that may be something that you have no control over, or it may may be. Maybe you can reduce the scope of the context of some piece of logic that it doesn't need to be around, so you're not opening your control uh, your connection longer than you actually need. Then you can see the post filters and the pre filters and the view executing, and you can see that kind of all the way down uh, as we hit the tail end. So there's a huge amount of information that you can get out of this by the look of it. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you click on like the SQL tab, for instance, we can get right in there and actually show you for the EF queries that we have here, um, these are the actual queries that are being generated. Okay, and we can see so exactly how long they took. Yeah, so this is probably my, my other favorite tab, which is the other one I wanted to look at, and particularly useful if you're using Entity Framework or, or something along those lines. Um, really, really useful for doing that. Um, I, it, you, you tweeted about a blog post that I wrote a little while ago about um, mm -hmm. uh, connecting this up to, an, to any other ADO connection. So that, that was the reason I did it, was to find out the information that was for the queries that were being sent to my SQL Server. Um, Really great for diagnosing things like N plus one um, select issues, um, which is mm -hmm. what I use it for about 90% of the time, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. And so here we can actually notice something else interesting that um, see how it says at the top connections per command and then we've got another heading inside of that and it's got an ordinal position of one. We're working mm -hmm. on the UX behind this, but we can see that outer row, as it were, the connections per uh, commands per connections, <coughs> where it's got that duration, is actually the connection that's formed for that. And so this reflects what we saw on the waterfall screen, that the duration was 134 milliseconds, but then the command duration was only two and a half milliseconds. Now, if we scroll down, we can actually see that we have a whole bunch of other connections that were created, each of which only had one command. Now, in this case, because of the architecture that you have, you have child actions, which you're trying to consolidate logic onto. Maybe you have no choice about the fact that you're opening another connection. Okay, But we're really trying to surface that, hey, yeah, if you're giving and closing more connections than you're meaning to, or as um, as was said earlier, n plus one occurrences where you're getting into a tight tight loop of you know something that's being lazy loaded or who knows what, but really trying yeah. to get visibility of of that and trying to surface that is I think is really important and part of the motivation behind this. Another thing yeah. I really like about this is that you can uh, just copy the commands. So one of the things that we've done is uh, by default any framework will um, give you a query that where it would say, you know, extend um, one name equals rock down there. It wouldn't have rock, it would actually just have the parameter because it's using parameterized queries. Um, but in this case, we've gone through and replaced that so that if you wanted to, you could just copy this SQL command and drop it, the, drop it into, you know, SQL Server Management Studio, execute so you could actually, you know, start tweaking that query if you needed to. That's really cool. I haven't noticed that before, actually. Yeah. Um, besides that, some stuff if we get into is uh, an interesting one if we go back to the home page. 
um, is the trace tab. So uh, in uh, web forms, you had the trace add.axd page that you could do, go to to start getting an output of what's going on in the server. Uh, we've brought that back, okay, uh, here in Glimpse. So if you're using log for net or something like that and you want to output to the trace writer uh, or mm -hmm. Uh, you just happen to have diagnostics dot, uh, trace or something like that that you're leveraging. Uh, we'll pick it up here in Glimpse. Uh, and we can actually show you the view resolution as well. So the same way that the execution tab kind of shows you the execution pipeline from a controller and filters perspective, the views kind of show the resolution perspective. So how what uh, engines did we look through to actually um, find your particular views? So in this case, we can see that the requested view was indexed uh, and that we can see we went through the web forms view engine, we went through the Razor view engine, both looking in the cache, and then we flipped once we couldn't find it there. So looking in the web forms view engine, even details there, um, which uh, where it looked on disk, uh, if we go up to expand, on the, the one above it, yep, there. We can actually see here are the locations that the web forms view engine went to look uh, to see if this page existed. Didn't find it there. Eventually, the Razor view engine did find that uh, find that particular uh, view and was able to you know uh, uh, resolve that view. And you can see the model types uh, for uh, stuff that you're actually returning there. And so there's the match. So. So here we can kind of gather an understanding that um, we've got the web forms view engine registered and it's looking for the uh, through the web form view engine each time even though we're not actually using it. Now there are some optimizations that are done by um, MVC when you're in release mode as opposed to debug, but it's still there, mm -hmm. it's still something that it will be looking at at some point. Okay, so that's uh, like an immediate point of something you found that is happening that doesn't need to be happening because I can give you performance exactly. improvements almost immediately, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we might jump out of this and, and um, move on. Um, one thing I was going to ask you as well is these um, these tabs that are all there, um, I understand there's some pretty easy extensibility points for adding your mm -hmm. own information. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so the part of what's made Glimpse uh, so useful to so many people is the fact that the extensibility model is extremely easy, meaning you can go along, implement one base class or interface, depending on if you want some default uh, implementations for you, um, and expose whatever it is that you want to return and get up and running and that's it. So you just inherit that interface at some point and Glimpse will discover it. Okay, there's no XML registration, there's no code configuration or anything like that. All you have to do is have a DLL in your bin that inherits from that particular interface and it'll pick up. So it's extremely easy to get up and running. Um, besides that, that's really all you have to do. Okay, is there any limit to the types of information you can send to the client or, or is it pretty much anything goes? No, pretty much anything goes. Uh, there's probably some data that would be advisable not to return, uh, but beyond that, um, and, and I think that's just being sensible, uh, i.e., you know, heavily recursive data structures or, you know, stuff like that. But usually what you're trying to show here isn't that sort of information. Um, mm. So the interface does have a get data method, okay, and that basically passes uh, in a context, and all it expects back is an object. You can pretty much return any object to it, and Glimpse will figure out how to view that object. So if you return a list of object type X, we'll render a list, and you know just like what you're seeing in front of you. If you return just an object, we'll render it as a key value pair. So Glimpse is pretty persistent and pretty you know good at trying to figure out how how it should actually format that object and that data. Can you have a bit more granular control over how it looks? Like I understand the views and a lot of these ones give you um, some, some nice information for lists of, of um, objects, but for example, your timeline has a lot of really so, rich UI. <laughs> Yep, so Glimpse has got, so there's several levels to this. Um, you can just return an object or you can just return a list of objects and Glimpse will work it out at the most basic level. If you want to jump up to a more fine-grained control, i.e. dictating I want this to be aligned left or aligned right, 
or um, I want it to be bold or uh, some sort of formatting or the width of the column or what the layout looks like. Uh, you can actually control that via some metadata which is pretty easy to set. Um, and then in an essence you get full control over your layout. Um, beyond that, we've got also got a client-side plugin model as well. So in this case for Timeline, there's a client-side plugin uh, for Timeline that basically expects the Timeline data to be sent down in a particular format. And once that comes down uh, from the server, it takes over and it says instead of the normal rendering engine for Glimpse cutting in, we'll actually uh, go ahead and, um, you know, render that completely on site plugin and it's just JavaScript, you can virtually do anything you want, which is exactly what we've done here. And so you've even got those little handles. I'm, I'm not sure if you've noticed this before, but uh, if you go over to, yep, yeah, we can actually zoom in on the timeline by dragging that over to the right. Um, and we can do the same uh, with the other one uh, coming back the other way. Um, so yeah, we're, we're essentially pulling into the timeline. Uh, the other thing that we can do here uh, is switch views. So over on the left uh, next to the category um, uh, up there on the label, yep, mm -hmm. there, we can switch views. So if you don't happen to like this particular timeline view, we can switch it and we give you a more table-based layout. And again, you'll notice if, if you zoom back out, <laughs> Plus me. Uh, there you'll see those records coming back in uh, for what it is and you'll see that timing column which gives you that representation that we saw earlier except condensed into one column. Great, that's awesome. Um, so these are, so the timeline comes out of the box. SQL comes with uh, EF. Um, the MVC stuff like routes and views and so on comes with the MVC package. Um, have you seen any other good packages or any other tabs that, that are worthwhile checking out. Yeah, um, there's a lot of people who have put time and effort into creating some pretty kick-ass plugins. Um, we've got like Elma, for instance, if you want to see the exceptions that are raised. Uh, we, we've tried not to reinvent the wheel and, you know, build that into Glimpse. Um, and, you know, someone has gone ahead and taken the extensibility model that Elma provides with the extensibility model Glimpse provides. And you can see the, la the t last X amount of requests right there within Glimpse. Uh, likewise okay. for showing N log, um, you know, rather than needing to change N log to output to trace writer or something like that, you can just install that and you'll get another tab for logging and you'll be able to see all your log output, um, which is giving you more application specific style stuff. Um, it's stuff that's not public. I've even seen uh, people uh, going ahead and let's say they're Amazon and they've got like a shopping cart or something like that and they want to show, you know, what's actually in the shopping cart. So I know the website kind of provides you with a list of it, but that's very different to like the domain models or something like that that you may actually want to see. Um, another example is, let's say your website's got some very complex authentication models, which means different parts of your UI won't show up for various reasons. So it could be a combination of your um, you know, your user level role with where you're located, with what time of day it is, with what partnership level you have might dictate whether or not that widget shows up. And <coughs> so what these people did is they went ahead and um, built a plugin that would expose that model and how that thing was actually working. And so you could see, ah, that thing, the, there's 10 widgets on this page. These four didn't show up because of this reason. And you'd be able to see yeah. that. Awesome. So, so that's uh, so. This is a glimpse in the current or in the current state when mm -hmm. we recorded this video. So, mm -hmm. um, I understand that there's some new stuff either on the horizon or maybe just released. Um, yeah, can you tell me a bit about that? Mm -hmm. Something too with uh, glimpses that we have all of this really cool information, and this information is really really good to be able to get access to if you have a problem or you're just wanting to gain more understanding or maybe you're learning or whatever else. But let's say you're just in your day to day uh, development job, you know, opening glimpse up, you know, taking up like screen real estate like this as you switch between requests. As cool as the information is, you know, it's not necessarily something that you're going to be dedicating screen real estate. 
to. That said, we still thought we've got all of this really good information that, you know, really key nuggets of information like how long, the, what, the, just even what the root controller and action were that were hit to, to serve this request or how long that root action and view took or how long did the request take or how many SQL requests were there and how long did they take. So we're looking at fairly fundamental data that if it was just there would be pretty cool. So what we've actually done is if you minimize glimpse um, in the future what you'll see is um, that instead of it just being like the bird, we'll actually extend that out okay and what you'll actually see is these key bits of information uh, laid out on this uh, on this um, uh, in that in this box and from there uh, you can just navigate around just the same way that you can navigate around with glimpse open uh, with the glimpse closed or minimized like this you'll be able to navigate around and it'll be giving you that those key bits of information just as, as you navigate around uh, and from there let's say you wanted to dive in to get a little bit more information on something you could just mouse over or click on one of those sections of data and it would bring open you know kind of a, a bit more of a deep diet down deep dive view on this. And so I think this comes back to some of the realizations that we've had with Glimpse that in the past, debugging and diagnostics with, you know, breakpoints or log files or whatever else it might be is kind of the one foot view of debugging. And the reason is, is that when you set a breakpoint, you, you're frozen in a moment in time. You, you don't have like a context of like what happened up to this point or, you know, what's the whole route look like. What's that? And likewise with log files, it's kind of hard to get an appreciation for you know what made up a request and how that's put together. Um, mm. And so if we said that those are the one foot view of debugging and diagnostics, and we said, well, what happens if we jump up to the ten thousand foot view? What would that look like? And you know, we kind of think that that's these key nuggets of information that we can put there for you the whole time. And then you know, the way that Glimpse is at the moment, you know, with something like the timeline tab is kind of like the eight thousand foot view. And then something like the execution tab or the view tab is the next level down. Maybe that's the five thousand foot view, and trace is like the four thousand foot view. You know, so it's kind of these logical progressions down down the stack depending on what problem you have or what view of the system you're trying to gain. And this is where I think Glimpse has really started to mature in how we think about this. Um, and and the thinking about the different modes of development, i.e. are you actively trying to solve a problem that you have or and trying to use Glimpse to solve that problem or are you just learning how you work and Glimpse can tell you, hey, over here you have a problem with something. You've told me this is not acceptable and you know I'm going to flag that for you when it occurs. So you don't even need to think so, about it. So on that one you can set th uh, thresholds on certain things to, to Yeah, so I'm not sure I'm not sure if this will make it in for day 1, but certainly the idea would be is that uh, you'd be able to set thresholds on uh, these various numbers in the future and so that it actually flag it and say hey look, you know, you've had you've got a policy in your company where you can't have any more than five SQL requests on a page, full stop, you know, SQL queries. And if you go over that, you have to use caching. It doesn't matter. You have to do it. Okay. And I know mm -hmm. companies that actually have those sorts of policies. How are you supposed to enforce that normally? Like, I, I don't even know where I'd try and start trying to gather that sort of information. And, you know, yeah. typically with Glimpse in the past, you'd have to open it up, up to the SQL tab to start trying to get that information, which again is, is okay, but it's not, you know, ideal. Whereas if we can actually mm -hmm. sit here and you're or a lead level that you're doing your day to day and you know that this is in play and you know something's gone red down the bottom here and you can say whoops you know even before you check in that code that you know I have a problem it's told me you know I might have thought that remembered that policy off the top of my head before I did that check in but even way before I get to code review or you know doing performance reviews or whatever else you'll start seeing this stuff and it could even be you know in dev no page can take longer than a second to load if a page in dev is taking you know in debug like on your local machine is taking longer than a second to load you probably have a problem but most of the time as we're navigating around, you kind of might see a slow page and you're like, did that take longer than a second? Maybe. No? I, I don't know. So how do you know? 
And so it can flag you and say, hey, look, it was longer than a second. Okay, it was 1.6 seconds or something. And here's why. Because from here, from this 10,000 foot view, you can actually start drilling down and see what the culprit is. So the next view might be, oh, the server took a really long time. So it wasn't the client, it wasn't the network. It so, okay, and from there, we'll say, look, it was actually the sequel that took a really, really long time here. Okay, or it wasn't even the sequel. Maybe it was some, you know, request that went to another server, or who, who knows where. Cool. That's really good. The the idea of having uh, that little dashboard there to that you can keep open the entire time while you're developing without without doing um, without taking too much of your screen real estate should be awesome. I know definitely when I'm doing web dev, I'll frequently, you know, hit F12 to open um, the dev tools, but you wouldn't want to leave that open while you were doing your day-to-day -day, um, development. Yeah, and what I, I think one of the, even though um, this this new dashboard or is in its infancy, I think we're starting to come to some pretty quick realizations with it that we kind of initially thought of it as like the dashboard for information in clips. But what happens if you said it's just a dashboard for X information? Okay, regardless of its information that Glimpse has got, what if it could get some in information from the browser? Okay, now it turns out that what I'm about to say is quite hard, so you know we probably right. won't see this anytime soon. But what happens if we could so show CPU and memory usage in the, in this little space right there? Okay, so you don't have to open up Chrome extensions, you don't have to start profiling, all this sort of stuff. It's just there. You know, or what happens if we could show you DOM inserts? So as you're, you know, doing some, something like you might have, um, you know, re drag something around the screen and when you add it to a new list, that triggers some sort of, you know, JavaScript to run which might insert some elements. And all of a sudden you've, you don't realize that you've just inserted 10,000 elements for instance, yeah. you know, and that memory, you know, shoots through the roof when you actually do that. You know, how, today, how are you supposed to know that? I know very few people that add, you know, that sort of profiling into their, into their workflow uh, or even page size, you know, uh, of your g given pages or how many assets they've got and, you know, so this sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. inherently, that's not data that the Glimpse backend is collecting. <laughs> This is just data that we have access to, um, and so this is why this thought of Glimpse as a platform is is really, I think, the key to Glimpse's future. Um, yeah. In animation. Right. That sounds like the um, kind of dashboard, the one dashboard to rule them all, which is very cool. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I don't think we, we we're kind of saying that uh, this is the be all and end all, but mm. the fact that no one's doing this yet and we can do it and we have the platform to do it. Um, I think it's just being really intelligent about how we do it. And so we're spending, you know, a g good investment of our time to try and sort this out. And hopefully the community responds to it and is able to give us some pretty good feedback on, you know, what it wants and how it wants it to work. Because, you know, there's different data that you want in different scenarios, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but having a, a configuration screen where you can have a million tick boxes for a million bits of data that you can choose from to see isn't necessarily the solution. So how can we be really smart about what data we show you and the context we show you that and all this sort of stuff. Oh, and if you if you want to download Glimpse, uh, you would have seen the website earlier, uh, getglimpse.com. Yeah. Uh, go there, otherwise uh, go to Nougat and try it out. So, and if you feel Excellent. like contributing to an open source project, please get in contact. Um, we're always happy to have people come along and help us out. Uh, Glimpse wouldn't be where it is today without the, the help and support uh, of, you know, the community. Uh, it is a community-built project for the community, and I think that's really, really important. And I also want to give a shout-out to our sponsors, Redgate, that without them, you know, we wouldn't be, um, you know, have the time to work on this. So really big heads up and thanks there. So if you want to talk to me directly, hit me up on Twitter. I'm Anthony underscore VDH. Yeah, cool. All right, well, thank you very much for joining me. Glimpse, definitely one of my favorite tools, and it sounds like uh, there's some fantastic stuff coming up in the future. So um, thanks, Anthony, for joining us, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks for having me on board today. I really do appreciate it.